Hi, it's Justine Harcourt to Tourville. We are poolside at South by Southwest. We're at the JW Marriott, home of the virtual cinema, which is just a few floors down. And some of the many entries that are there, there's 25. One of them is a horse from We Make VR. And we're going to be speaking with We Make VR's Avanash Chenga. He's also going to be talking with us about some of the evolutions in VR and some of the new research that he's been delving into. So stay tuned and let's hear it for Avinash. Welcome, Avinash. Thank you for joining us here at South by Southwest. My pleasure. And it's a great conference. What have you seen so far that has really triggered you? Oh, good question. Um, I saw the installation of... Um, for minus 27 Celsius, which is uh, an experience made by Jan Kuna mm -hmm. um, and uh, Amori, who also worked on uh, Notes on Blindness. So this is basically their next piece. Um, little side note, Not Notes on Blindness was just voted as one of the top 10 pieces that's actually meaningful or that actually has had an impact. And uh, I was excited to see their, their next piece. You can't go into too much detail. You kind of have to, as with immersive, you have to experience it for yourself. But it's great to see that people are queuing up for these new type of experiences that are not just about the gimmick of VR or, or the hype or, you know, big explosions or like the Michael Bay VR, but that <laughs> actually tell, um, not just tell the story, but give people an experience that um, triggers thinking. And it's memorable. And, uh, and Absolutely. And, yeah, you feel it. Let's, um, you've been in VR for a while. I hear 2012, that is yes. seven years ago now. Yes. Um, how have things changed for you? And well, prior to VR, um, back in 2007, we already explored, uh, AR augmented reality, um, which everyone kind of forgot. And then on the wake of the rise of VR, AR came back. So what's changed over time is that what, wait, 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 what was in 2007, what was AR like? Ah, okay. So what would that what would have that look like? There was a lot of, um, I would say, um, it was there were uh, applications like Layer, um, and there were engines um, like Metaio. So basically, what they did is we would use the webcam on your laptop or on your desktop computer, and you would, for example, take up a, a magazine, a print magazine, and the webcam would recognize a print ad, and if you would hold that in front of your webcam, on your screen, you would see a little video display with the magazine, and then we would project a character or a 3D object on top of that. So we would track it in 3D space. Okay, that's what the primitive technology was then. So yes. in 2007, all right. You were doing in the AR space in 2007. In and well, we, we had a, a 3D or CGI animation studio. So okay. we did visual effects um, for feature films, short films, advertising, you name it. And that means that we had a team of creatives that were very much natives to digital production techniques. And in our vision, to, or in my vision, to me, it doesn't matter what the end platform is. The production process of creating a 3D model or filming something or doing uh, visual effects remains the same regardless if you're going to show that on a mobile phone or on a cinema screen, largely. I mean, once you get to that final stage, then it changes. So. Because of that, um, being native to that technology, we got a very early prototype of the Oculus DK1 with the request like, hey, can you guys make digital content for this? I'm like, okay, sure, we could. After playing around with that for a couple of weeks, I was like, okay, this is fun, but hang on. We've grown up with films like Existence and The Matrix and in pop culture, we have this very different vision of VR, these realistic immersive worlds. So I was like, couldn't we make that? So we ended up inventing the first proper natural stereoscopic uh, VR camera back in 2012. And things took off from that. At that point, everyone was focused on the technology, on cameras, on headsets, and all of that. Whereas it's not really about that. But that is something that happens with emerging technologies. Everyone looks at the hardware. Whereas we were like, no, we want to create experiences. And I think that is the thing that has changed over time. So now um, we're getting to a stage where the average consumer is focusing less and less on the hardware, on the headsets, even though they still do. But there, you hear conversations that are more about immersive experiences. 
about uh, an interesting game or an interesting 360 video or something that is neither of those and that they can't really put a tag on, but it is something that they get um, uh, either an emotional response from or passionate about. And that's interesting. That I think has changed in the last uh, seven years. But that is, I, I'd say it's more true for the professional side of the industry. When you look at consumers, they are now getting to the stage like, oh, right. I've heard about VR. It's the thing from Oculus, right? Or that little gray box that you can buy for 200 bucks, um, which, or I can watch na Netflix on that thing. So that's interesting that you see that the average consumer is using a VR headset like an Oculus Go and that 80% of those users are using it for Netflix to watch Netflix in bed. So non-360 non video, non-VR games, but at least those devices are getting out there. And that's very different from three years ago. Okay, so um, people are using headsets, very good thing. And when did you first get into VR? Well, I grew up- From AR. Right. I mean, well, it, it, it actually goes further back than that because as a kid, um, I was always fascinated by other worlds, um, video games and comic books and sci-fi movies. So I, I grew up with a desire like, oh, could I venture into other worlds? That desire like, oh, I'm playing a video game. What if I could step into that screen and be part of that? So growing up, I tried all the, the as most VR pioneers have done, tried all the different VR headsets, which were all pieces of crap. Um, but then when we heard about the Oculus Kickstarter, it was like, is this, is this really going to make that big of a deal? Is this, is this I mean, not, is, initially you think like, oh, this is yet another attempt at a VR headset. But no, it was actually more than that. So after, I would say a year after we got the DK1 and in the process of, of developing that initial camera, we got this is like, okay, we're gonna close shop on our CGI studio and we're gonna launch We Make VR and we're gonna go all in. VR is going to be the future, not in its, in its form at, as it was at the time, as in 360 videos or, or very basic animated games, but more as what convinced me was I saw the potential, uh, the way that this new immersive technology can and will fundamentally change the world, change our way of life, change the way that we communicate, change the way we educate ourselves, change the way we uh, improve quality of life. And because that is something that's close to my heart, um, that desire to improve the world, um, it, was, it, it, was, it wasn't even a decision, it just happened naturally. Like, okay, this is where I need to go. Everything I've done in my life has kind of steered me here this, and cult uh, culminates in immersive. I wouldn't say VR. I mean, we're trying to, even though we're cold, we make VR. We're trying to get rid of the term VR or XR or AR or MR or all those R's. It's, we are crafting immersive experiences and we don't have a good terminology for that yet. So we're not calling ourselves MX or something. Yet. Oh my God. I mean, <laughs> it's, I, every time someone tries to, tries to come up with this new term, I, I, it still has to find its, its right terminology, something that people will remember and something that makes sense. But we always keep trying to, being humans, trying to shoehorn it into a little box somewhere. Right. But we'll, we'll, we'll I, and okay. that's another big change. So you're literally trying to come out of the box. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, but tell me then, so you've had a lifelong passion for immersive. It, it led you down to form a company called We Make VR. What was the first thing you made? The first thing we made was a tour through the canals of Amsterdam. Because when you live in Amsterdam, everyone knows the canals and a lot of people have boats, as do I. So when we had that first camera, which was literally hot glue and blocks of wood and rubber band just held it together, we put the camera on that boat and took a little tour through the canals of Amsterdam. And then we spent, I'd say three or four months manually, frame by frame, stitching the whole thing together because there was no stitching software. Wow. And I mean, this was pre auto pano and video stitch and all that. So back at the office, we put people inside our prototype headsets and they would look around and be amazed like, oh, I can see other boats. I can see people on bikes. And interesting thing happened. That was one of our interesting first discoveries. While we were filming, there was a boat coming in the opposite direction. And as people are on boats, do they wave to each other? So someone waved at us while we were filming in the office. 
every single person would instinctively wave back to the person on the boat, even though they are fully aware that they're sitting in an office wearing a piece of plastic on their head. So that's a really good marker of um, a really immersive experience, isn't it? Well, when you feel like you're in it and you can see it and you're, auto you're, you're on automatic pilot, so to speak. Exactly. You have an instinctive natural response, but it, it went even further than that. And that is what, what for, for me personally, was the biggest eye-opener and tipping point. This experience took about four minutes. They would take off the headset and then they would look around in the studio. And after a while, they would ask the host, like, all right, that was really cool, but where is the fan and where's the heat blower? And we were initially confused because we had none. So we said, no, uh, no, no, you're pulling my leg because there has to be something hidden here because I felt the wind in my face and I felt the heat from the sun. And then we realized, hang on, if the experience is complete enough and realistic enough, your brain becomes quite malleable and starts to fill in the blanks. And that was for us the, the main reason to partner up with researchers and universities. And we had the question like, okay, we now know that we can make all this stuff. Why does it work the way it does? Why do certain experiences work and why do other experiences do not work, even though we instinctively think it's gonna work? So, and it turns out that this entire industry for us as makers is extremely counterintuitive. Anything that we think is going to work doesn't. For example, everyone initially in that first VR wave was like, oh, we're going to do first person shooters in VR. Everyone's going to be playing COD and, um, and other first person shooters in VR headsets. Turns out that that is still to this date, a really hard genre to crack because people get nauseous. It doesn't translate well. Will you explain COD for anyone that oh, may not Call, know? Call of Duty. Uh, Call of Duty is a first-person shooter, and there are many like it. Oh, sorry for the COD fans. Mm -hmm. But um, the whole aspect of running around, shooting stuff, um, that initially is like, oh, yeah, because everyone's like, oh, if you can run around in VR, that's going to make a lot of sense. So then we saw things like uh, the Virtuix Omni and other like platforms that you could run on in space, because uh, in, in place. Because if you would be, be running around wearing a VR headset in your living room, you're going to bump into walls. But even with those kind of technologies, it doesn't really work. The rules for creating immersive experiences are fundamentally different. So we set out um, seven years ago uh, on a mission to explore these rules. Why do certain things work and do, why don't they work? And how can we share that? How can we share that knowledge with other makers. So you went, you, you partnered with universities to discover this research? Yes. To basically we would, we would discover, oh, hey, we have an issue here. We don't, we know that something works, but we don't know why. For example, we know that people now experience heat or cold or wind. Why do they do that? Is that, does that, is that frame rate? Well, it's not happening. So, so it, they, the the brain fills it in. Well, yeah, I mean, the, it, it's not, it's not real. It's not a real physiology. Uh, it's, it's your brain that tells you, hey, you're feeling heat. So, but we don't know why, because we still associate the medium with a primarily visual medium. And then we're like, well, if you're in the, in, 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 in the cinema, um, yeah, I mean, you can sort of get, get that idea like, oh, I'm feeling the cold because we're seeing a movie about the North Pole, but you don't, you know the difference. And with VR, you start not noting the difference anymore. You start getting confused or your, your brain becomes confused between what is simulated and what isn't, which kind of makes sense because everything that you experience as, as a human being is dictated by your brain. If your brain tells you that you have an ouch, you have an ouch, even though it's not there. So. When we encounter these things, um, we brief that to universities like, hey, could you research if this sensation of heat has to do with the brightness of the image or the frame rate or the setting or is it sound? And slowly but surely, we are getting to grips with more of these. Um, basically, we're expanding the vocabulary of this new language that we're uh, this, uh, exploring. So that's that. That on its own, of course, is not what drives us. What drives me personally and by effect us as a company is I want to create experiences that can, for example, improve quality of life, that can help you conquer a fear or that can help you get over agoraphobia. Then we work back from that. So if we then want to create an experience, what ingredients do we need? Do we need 
um, do we need someone to uh, be visually engaged? Do we need stereoscopic imaging to get that emotional connection? Do we need high frame rate? Um, I mean, these are, of course, the technical uh, things that the researchers or the universities help us out with. But it's always um, experience driven or in that sense, the goal is we want to make someone happy. How do we do that? We want And what to did you find? So does frame, frame rate matter or does the stereoscopic imagery do more? Absolutely. Um, and that is one of the things where our previous experience as a VFX company makes a lot of difference. We have been creating uh, stereoscopic visuals um, for, I would say, a decade and a half. So that helped us out at the beginning. So the first camera that we created for VR was built as a stereoscopic camera because we noticed that if you do a 360 monoscopic panoramic image, people are initially excited, like, oh, I can look around, but they don't get that sensation of being there. The brain never feels that you're there. And that's something that pops up in, for example, a functional MRI. If you have a 360 video, your visual cortex is engaged and you get the sensation that you're watching a movie that's projected around you. When you have proper nat human natural stereoscopic imaging, your brain actually fires in different regions and your brain perceives that as a image that you are seeing in real life. Now, if you would do post-conversion stereo, which is what we see in Hollywood a lot. Your brain doesn't do that. If you shoot it in proper native stereo that mimics what a human eye does, then you get that people, for example, can uh, develop uh, memories. And that's something where the research comes in. When you see this, you see actual new synaptic connections being made by your brain. So your brain cannot distinguish this new memory from a real memory. So the simulated memory is just as powerful or just as much the same as a, as a real, real experience memory. Well, from a physiological sense, yes. there is no difference. Of course. It is that same synaptic connection. Right. And there, there's a little interesting anecdote. A couple of years back, we were uh, hosting an event and we're doing demos. And one of our um, immersive directors was running, uh, showing a, a VR demo booth. And there was this lady with her son standing there and looking at, at the demo. And he was like, oh, I know her. Um, but he couldn't recall her name. Hour later, she was still walking around. And he, he, he started, started feeling bad because not only was he convinced that he knew her, he had a conversation with her, but he could not place it or recall her name. At the end of the day, um, turns out that we had created a VR experience where this lady was in with you. you. You were both on a swing on a super high skyscraper and it was a scary moment. And she looks at the camera and shares her anxiety with you. He had seen that and he was fully convinced that this was an actual experience that he had. Now, when I speak at conferences, I often talk about this. And he, this director who works for me, um, always considered that a marketing spiel. Like, oh yeah, you're, this was the first time that he had actually experienced the sensation of false memory. And this is something that works with in the VR space on a daily basis. So that was, I mean, very interesting to say the least, because once you get to the stage where you can realize that you can actually implant false memories, you get into a moral and ethical gray area. So that's another thing that I, I often like to talk about to um, the more experienced makers. What do we, now that we have the technological capabilities to create these kind of really strong, powerful, immersive experiences, what do we do uh, in terms of more morals and ethics and guidelines? I mean, is that up to us? Should we come up with guidelines as a community, as makers? Most of them just get too excited and just want to make cool stuff. But these are important conversations to have at this stage of the industry. Well, at this stage of the industry, VR is basically, we're all pirates, right? Um, trying to figure it out. The rules aren't written. Uh, there's no uh, standards at, at this point. So everyone's trying to navigate the open waters and and maybe say, this is the best route here and this is the best route, you know, talking to each other. I, I would argue that um, in the last two and a half, three years, we are, are actually seeing standards emerge. We are actually getting slightly past that pirating 
initial pioneering, fully uncharted territory. I mean, so, we're, we're, I mean, we're just, this is the tip of the iceberg that we're hitting, but we are finding some common grounds. For example, at this age, we know that there's a fundamental difference between a 360 video and a 360 3D video. Um, so, and a couple of years ago, there was still a lot of debate, like, oh, it's still the same thing. Or um, the value of, for example, um, using smartphones in a cardboard or cardboard-like format. Two years ago. What's the verdict? <laughs> oh, it's dead. I mean, we've 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 abandoned uh, uh, smartphone formats and cardboards. It was great at the time. It was great to sort of get this initial wow factor. But the moment a average consumer gets past that wow factor, there needs to be some substance. And in my personal opinion, the smart the smartphone and um, cardboard type format will not deliver that substance. Simply because issues like uh, visual fidelity, frame rate, etc. Well, it's not a holistic experience, no, is it? You it's know, not. It's it's more a, a viewing, and you're still kind of an observer Absolutely. of VR. Yeah, and it it, it, it plays it, it plays on the gimmicky angle because you get someone that it's like the old the old viewmaster. You look at it. And then you pass it on to your buddy who's sitting next to you. Like, right. oh, look at this. I found a porn video in VR. Isn't that cool? And then, you know, you know everyone laughs about it for a couple of minutes. Then it's put on the shelf and no one considered it again. Whereas if you put someone in a, in a basic headset, like an, uh, like an Oculus Go, 200 bucks, and, you, and that person has sees something like, for example, Notes on Blindness that person will have a very profound experience and not think about the technology anymore, but think about the experience they had. And that's what we are seeing. That's where standards are emerging. I think that realization that cardboard doesn't cut it anymore, but better headsets are now affordable, like the Go and the upcoming Quest and the Five Focus, that that's gonna, going to basically up the ante a little bit. You know, the expectations for makers change and consumers and companies that, you know, commission content are getting more educated. Well, let me go back and find out when in some of the research that you've been doing, what research have you learned or gleaned rather that is really applicable for VR creators that work in narrative or cinematic? So one interesting, very recent discovery or something that we've been able to, uh, to, to prove a little bit better is frame rate. In that first wave of immersive content, a lot of people were making 30 frame per second, 360 degree videos. Yep, you will get that initial wow if someone hasn't seen anything anymore uh, or before. But then we started upping to 60 FPS. All right, um, that negates nausea. We can do a bit more high action stuff. And some people are kind of opposed to that because it doesn't have that cinematic feel that we're used to. So that's um, a decision that makers have to uh, have to make a call on. Like, do I want to create a piece that is like a Hollywood cinematic uh, narrative piece? Or do I want to create something that uh, will instill a memory or that is focused on transference of knowledge? Something magical happens once you start hitting 120 frames per second and up. And... It's not just that the image is smoother, it's that your brain has, uh, has, requires less effort to accept something as being real. The lower the frame rate, the more your brain has to work, work to, to bridge that gap between fiction and reality. So 120 is, is something that you, you've found. Yes. Anything else that you've found? Um, when it comes to social connections, as in, in a, a couple of years back, we were like, okay, if we want people to connect on an emotional level in a, a, a virtual space, we need super high resolution cameras on both sides of, uh, let's say this is a multi-user experience, on both sides of the, uh, of the field. And we discovered that that is not true. If both avatars um, have uh, animated pupils, and if you can hear someone's voice and if you can have a basic animation rig that mimics your physical motions uh, to your avatar, that's enough. If, it's, if on the other side you have someone that you know, you will recognize their voice, you will recognize very subtle physical motions that are translated to the avatar, um, you will see their pupillary gaze. And it doesn't matter if that character looks like a Lego character or a Donald Duck or a piece of tree bark, you connect. And 
that is again that's one of these things that is super counterintuitive the expectation was I want to reiterate that it is definitely counterintuitive to connect with a piece of tree bark. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And it's weird that it then ends up working. So, um, and that's, I think, where, where advancements in technology do help us. For example, getting to the stage where we can do pupil, pupillary tracking or, um, and then translate that to animating your avatar. That is a big difference. That is a... I mean, at the same time, we've seen the, the, the latest hype, or no, I wouldn't say hype, but the latest development. Over the past 18 months, we've seen a big insurgence of volumetric capturing. Everyone's right. playing around with, with connects and point clouds. And um, I'm like, ooh, it's not just a 360 video, but it's a volumetric character that they can walk around. So it's therefore going to be more real. And I think we've seen examples of that in, for example, the Blade Runner uh, promotional experience, something that was has a lot of a budget. It was commercially commissioned. So what happens in Blade Runner? You put on the headset and there's this volumetric actress, a nurse standing right in front of you and she looks you right in the eyes. And you're like, oh, this is very realistic. The moment you take a step to the left or to the right, you can, she stays in place. It's not a 360 video. You can actually walk around, but she keeps staring into midair in the place where you were. The moment that happens, in my opinion, your suspension of disbelief breaks. Your sense of immersion breaks. It doesn't work. Even though you, you're like, oh, this is the new frontier of immersive experiences, on an emotional level, you do not connect anymore. And that's something that uh, we started playing around with. Like, oh, can we rotate the, the avatar? Can we do something with gaze control? Can we animate the pupils? And it turns out that right now, I would say it's trying to achieve what we've done in high quality 360 stereoscopic video in volumetrics and trying to do the same thing on a narrative level, I don't think that right now is the road, is the, is, is, is the road forward. Because there's a technological gap there that we right now cannot um, solve. Even when your budget and talent is unlimited. If you look at um, Carnegie Arena, uh, Carnegie Arena, most of your audience will probably know it, is an immersive experience about crossing uh, the Mexican-US border with a, a family of refugees. With your feet in the sand and a backpack and exactly. haptic devices. So you, you get the... Yes. So it was made by Alejandro Ineruto, an Oscar-winning movie maker. Uh, the technical team was ILM XLab. Amazing guys. They do stunning work. Then, and I'm going to not... Well, let's not go into the narrative per se, but once you are in that, that desert and you have the sand under your feet and you see those volumetric... Uh, fam uh, uh, captured actors who form their family around you, they, again, don't make eye contact. They are there. You can walk around them, but they, they don't acknowledge your presence. They don't connect to you emotionally. So for a lot of people, it's a huge wow factor. But, and it makes people think, but not because that part of the VR experience was so, so solid. And mo mo one thing that we keep bumping into is that people get caught up in that initial wow factor. If someone of an average consumer has never seen or experienced a, a proper VR experience, the moment they put on a VR headset and see something new, they're like, oh, wow, this is really cool. And they project that sensation of, oh, this is something that's super innovative on the content, regardless of what that content is. So there's a lot of poor quality content that still gets high praise. Inyanruto's piece is, is an amazing piece. I, I'm, I'm super happy that it exists because it exposed millions of people who are not interested in technology and not interested in VR to an immersive experience. It was an eye-opener. And because of the name, because of the production and the quality, this piece has been shown around across the globe for the past two years. Well, and let's not forget that actual subject matter, the fact that he did even mm -hmm. not only introduced technology and immersive, but it, it introduced a powerful, uh, controversial subject to experience at a whole different level. So absolutely, it was, uh, you know, incredible on so many fronts checked yes. a lot of boxes incredible groundbreaking it paved the way for um for a lot of new makers um but it's a double-edged sword sword so because because you've got such a high name um so it's such a big name there's a lot of venues and museums that are like oh this immersive world is really cool we want another installation 
So we're going to look for the next super big name that we know from the film industry and hope that they are going to make something immersive and we're going to program that. Whereas from a storytelling uh, uh, standpoint, from a narrative perspective, it's a level playing field. There are tons of new makers, tons of talent who have no history in, in, in cinema, but can make something that is equally as impactful and worthwhile as Carnegie Arena. These makers have a hard time getting exposure for their pieces because they are not, they don't have that name. And True. the people that program the events don't have the technical experience or knowledge uh, to make that distinction. So, well, as a programmer, you're going to play it safe. And that's something that is, that is great about South By. You see projects that are programmed here that are not necessarily associated or made by these, um, these big names that have um, budgets that are in the tens of millions of dollars. There are pieces here that have been made for $50,000 uh, for or even less that are getting a platform. And that's something that I think for everyone that's making content now and it's not, not, not the people that are still learning how to stitch, or, but that are getting more into the actual uh, content side of things. It's easy to get discouraged. Like, oh, we can't compete with those big names. I would say, yeah, you can. It's, you just have to get out there and make these pieces that you are passionate about. I mean, if you do this, if you get into the industry now because you're like, oh, let's do a quick cash grab, you're gonna be sorely disappointed. We are running a marathon, not a sprint. And you have to, if you actually start a company now, if you become a maker, you need to have that long-term vision. Well, that's a good point because I'd like to end on what kind of advice do you have for young, young upcoming or even older people that want to make the transition from classic to VR? What kind of advice would you give them? You need to do this for the right reasons. Get into this immersive format or world or family because you have a deep personal desire to make a difference, to make beautiful art or to, uh, to make an impact. Don't get into this industry for the money at this stage. <laughs> I mean, cause I mean, it's, it, it'll get there, but just in, in, in certain simple market dynamics, we don't have a hundred million active VR users that have a headset in their homes right now who are willing to pay for content. At the same time, there is hope because Netflix just evaluated the, the success of Bandersnatch, which was their interactive next Episode, Netflix piece. Yeah. And even though it's an old concept, the, the choose your own adventure concept, it again has, same as Ian Ruda's piece, it has exposed millions of people who are not interested in tech, but are interested in cinematic or narrative experiences to this new format. They have doubled down. They are going to do the more investments in that area, which is going to help consumer adoption. This is going to open up consumers to, to their curiosity, to the explore more immersive experiences. And that's, I think, where the opportunities are for the new makers. So if you want to do something new, or if you want to get into this industry, don't look at the 360 videos, etc. Learn from it, but look beyond that. Look at the uncharted territory. It is, and I cannot say this enough, a level playing field. The guys that have millions of, uh, of dollars in production value don't have more knowledge than necessarily than you have. You can come up with a unique idea that no one has come up with and it can be a monster hit. Look at Beat Saber, you know? Three guys coming up with a very simple game that is now being played by millions and millions of people. Okay, it's not a story, it's not narrative, but it is content that you can make. And I would say in terms of narrative, in terms of stories, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. There are my, and that's, I, I think my strongest belief, especially for people that come from a traditional filmmaking industry, let go of what you know. Embrace the fact that you don't know anything and that none of us knows anything. Every single person in this industry that now says, we know how this works, Part of my French is full of shit because we don't. <laughs> well, with that, we are going to take the cue from the music that we hear because it wouldn't be South by if there wasn't music and excitement all around us. And thanks so much again for joining us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure.